the Torah makes a statement about the language or tongue of the people where God is not including himself as speaking the same language as the people of the planet Earth, in Genesis 11:1, 6-7 where God says the people of the planet Earth, they all have one language. Genesis 11:1, 6-7, and the whole earth was of one language, and of one speech and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, there, and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech? The Aramaic, Hebrew, word used for language is Safa. When God decided to come down and confound the languages which is the word Bilal, he broke up the language that they were speaking into different tongues. Make note the word used for earth is Eretz, which is the same as the Arabic word art. If you read closely, you will see in verse 6, God separated him slash herself from the planet earth by saying and they all have one language. If you say that they all have one language, you are saying that you do not speak that language in which is being spoken, because you just excluded yourself by saying they. Then in verse 7, God goes on to say confound their language. The word for confound is Bilal, in the Aramaic, Hebrew, and means to mingle, confuse or to confound. This is making it very clear that whatever the people on earth were speaking, it was not being spoken in heaven, where God lives. If it was the language that God was speaking, then he would have said our language, however, it says there, which means that God was speaking something else other than their language. Do you understand? The word there in the English language, us used to show possession, meaning belonging to that person or that thing. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, the word there means, there, the possessive form of they. 1. Used as a modifier before a noun, Middle English, from Old Norse thera, theirs. Take for instance, if you were to say to some that is their country, that would mean that it is not the same country in which you live, you just excluded yourself. Well, this is the same thing that God did in Genesis chapter 11. So, if God came down to the planet Earth, and confounded their language of the planet Earth, that would mean that God was communicating differently. When a language is broken up, it is broken up into different tongues which are called dialects. So, again I ask, what is God's language? Or better yet, what was God speaking in heaven when he was telling the angels in Genesis 11:7 to let us go down, there and confound their language? What language was he speaking when he said let us make man, in Genesis 1:27? And it doesn't stop there. The whole reason God had to come down to earth in the first place, was to see what Nimrod, a mortal human being, was doing. If your God is so great why did he confuse the languages in Babylon when Nimrod and his followers tried to build a tower tall enough to reach the heavens? Genesis 11:4. And they, the families, sons of Noah said, Now let us go and build for ourselves a city and have in it a tower, whose head will reach up into the skies, and it will make our skyship, Shama, known or we will be scattered all across the face of the planet Earth. Now if God is in heaven, far beyond the stars, beyond the planets, beyond our solar system, somewhere out there in the universe, then why was he afraid that some mortal men could build a tower that would be able to reach him, unless they could? It is obvious that it could be done by the fact that in Genesis 11:5 the head God Yahweh said and I quote, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Means that there is nothing that the children of men won't be able to do if they put their minds to it. Whatever these mortals imagine to do, they can do it. In knowing that, that is when Yahweh decided to come to the planet Earth and mix up their language so that they wouldn't be able to communicate. Why? Why would God have to go through all of this? If God has a much power and control that people say he does, all he would have had to say was Nimrod, the angels and I talked it over and we don't want to come up here. Being that he was the almighty God, Nimrod and his followers would have respected that and stopped construction on the tower. I mean this is God we're talking here, right? Taking into consideration that this was thousands of years ago, the technology was not that advanced so there is no way that they could have reached the heavens which you claim is further than the furthest star, even if they tried. This is how you know that this heaven that the Bible is talking about must really be right here on earth. In this day and time, there is advanced technology and mortal men are capable of constructing buildings that are over a thousand feet high such as the Sears, Roebuck Tower in Chicago, Illinois which is a 110-story building and rises to a height of 1,454 feet to be exact. It was built between 1970 AD and 1974 AD. If it took four years to build a tower of such stature in the early 70s, using the technology of that time, can you imagine how long it would have taken Nimrod to complete the Tower of Babel if he was trying to reach heaven as the Bible says? You say heaven is further than the furthest star when you're talking to a person on the planet Earth. Your furthest star is your sun and it's a part of your solar system. 
God shouldn't have had anything to worry about because Nimrod would have to first get through Earth's seven spheres. An all-knowing God would know that. The spheres are, troposphere, exosphere, stratosphere, heterosphere, mesosphere, homosphere, and thermosphere. It is obvious that someone gave you all the wrong interpretations of the Tower of Babel story or what is written in the English is not what was originally written. Again, you have been tricked. And another point I would like to address while we are talking about Genesis chapter 11 is, by it stating in Genesis 11:6 that the whole earth was of one language, it is a contradiction. Proof of this can be found in Genesis 10:5, where it states, Genesis 10:5, from these did they separate themselves from, the coastlands of the nations and their Gentile nation, each one after his tongue, after their clans and families, in their Gentile nation. It is clear that Aramaic, Hebrew, and Ashuric Syriac, Arabic, was not the only languages spoken in pre-Abrahamic time, yet it is believed by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. In Genesis 11 1 it states that everyone on the planet Earth was speaking the same language. However, right in Genesis 10 5 as I have shown you, in the previous quote, it states that everyone after his tongue, and after his clan and their families. To say that everyone is after his tongue, would mean there was more than one tongue being spoken at the time. Because the word being used is his meaning his own, which is a possessive form. According to the American Heritage Dictionary the word is is, the possessive form of he. 1. Used as a modifier before a noun, used to indicate the one or ones belonging to him. If you can't find your hat, take his. Middle English, from Old English, by reading Genesis 10:5, it is very clear that there was already more than one language being spoken, being that tongues are broken off from languages. Each after his own tongue, and I quote, divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Remember, the language comes first, then tongues which are also called dialects, are broken off from the language. Genesis 11:7 is making it seem as if this is the first time that God divided the languages of tongues of people, and prior to that, everybody spoke one language. Genesis 11:7, Come let us the Elohim Anunnaki and Yahuwah go down there and confuse their words so that they will not overstand one another's words. The word for people in this quote is the Aramaic, Hebrew, word am, meaning nation of people. This clearly states that God is talking about one nation of people and that all of them, within that nation spoke one tongue. And these people according to Genesis 11:9, became known as the Babylonians. As you can plainly see, there was already more than one language. So, this is indeed another contradiction of your Bible. So God confused the language of these people and made it into many dialects. For when we say, language, we are speaking about a classical form and when we say tongue, we are talking about the linguistic use of a set language or what is called colloquial, that breaks off into various dialects according to religions. And in this case, Genesis 10:1 tells you clearly who this group or nation of people are. The Quran you read is not the original. It is not in the original order as it was revealed, it has been mistranslated and now it has vowels which the original text didn't have. I have been challenging this for years. You come up with all kings of quotes about what the Jews of Medina did to the Torah between the years 610 to 632 AD, and this causes you not to read the entire Bible. How can you Muslims use a verse in the Quran for an incident that took place in Medina many years ago with the Jews in order to justify the Torah being tampered with? Muslims don't even know what the Bible is. They think Quran 348, 350, 393, 543, 544, 546, 568, 5 to 110, 7 to 157, 9 to 111, 48 29, 61 to 6, and 625 is speaking about the whole 66 books of the Bible, ask them, they don't even know that the Torah is actuality consists of only 5 books. And when Muslims speak about the Quran they act as if it is in its purest form. Sorry but this just isn't fact. The Quran that you hold in your hand today has been tampered with and is filled with contradictions and errors. If you ask a Muslim do they have the original Quran, if they are honest, they will tell you no. In fact, the original Quran was burned by a man named Uthman ibn Affan ibn Abdul Asi, 574-656 AD Uthman was Muhammad's son-in-law by marriage to his daughters Rukhaya and Umkultum. Uthman was a black Arab from the tribe of Umawa, an affluent clan of Abd Sham's branch of the tribe of Quraysh. He was an influential Meccan who became a close companion of Muhammad. Uthman's wealth and position, was an asset to the growing Muslim community. Uthman is responsible for arranging the chapters of the Quran in the order that it is today. Yet, he did not receive special instructions in collecting and collating the Quran. He reigned for 11 years which caused great grievances, especially with the revolution led by Al-Ghafiqi from Egypt, which cost him his life. The Quran that you hold in your hand today, was written, 
and put together by a group of Christian and Jewish scholars who later became known as the Jesuit priests, a group which was founded in 1534 AD. They were of the Roman Catholic Church which as you know is controlled by Jews. There were a group of seven advisors to the popes, ever since the time of the powerful Roman Catholic teacher named Augustine, 354 to 430 AD, who was on a mission to develop a technique to convert Arabs to Catholicism. The Jesuits were a part of the original orchestrators who were responsible for the killings of a group of men that had memorized the Quran and the placing of the false Muhammad named Musulimid ibn Habib al-Hanafi, 558-633 AD This new Quran was the main piece in the Vatican's game in bringing the Arabs under Roman rule. This Quran was first printed in Arabic with a Persian script called Nashki, which is the script that is in the Quran in both English and Arabic. So, this new Quran was put together in Rome, and given to a Catholic priest named Waraka ibn Nafal, 527-639 AD Muhammad was taught by Waraka, who was the uncle of Khadija, a strictly Christian businesswoman. Waraka ibn Nafal was a Christian, and was also from the Jews of Arabia Banu Qara'iza, Banu Nadar and Banu Kunarka. Islam is one of the biggest scams you can think of from the Catholic Church. Islam is simply overrated Christianity. Khadija didn't marry Muhammad for love, but because he was young and able to be manipulated and of the Quraysh tribe. Her family members and the Pope were trying to bring people from all over the world to that one spot, Mecca. A Christian named Abraha came from Ethiopia in the year 570 AD, to try to overthrow Mecca and bring in his trade. The Quraysh tribe was trying to keep control. Their family clan kept breaking up and intermarrying with other clans. Thus, they bred a Muhammad to try to unite the clans to keep the trade coming to Mecca. Chick Publications in California wrote a leaflet entitled The Storyteller by JTC, that told about how the Roman Catholic Church instituted Islam. The Quran was created by the Vatican. The Roman Catholic leader carefully created a new religion for the children of Ishmael by using a mixture of Babylonian, Jewish and Roman Catholic tradition plus the manuscripts of their corrupted Bible. Roman Catholics teach that a wealthy widow named Khadija donated her wealth to the Roman Catholic institution and retired to a convent. She was commissioned by time to leave the convent and look for an Arab who possessed charisma and leadership ability. The powerful Roman Catholic teacher Augustine, appeared in North Africa. He reworked the gospel, and pretended to be a Christian and a great apostle of Christ. His writings became famous. Augustine's mission was to develop a technique to convert Arabs to Catholicism, his vehicle was Muhammad. Muhammad's spiritual advisor was Warakwa, his wife's uncle. He counseled him on the interpretation of his visions. Being a faithful Roman Catholic, Warakwa guided Muhammad to give the Virgin Mary a place of prominence in the Quran. This would form a link between Islam and the Vatican. The Vatican, under the Pope Boniface V and his successor Honorius I secretly financed Muhammad's military for the exchange of Jerusalem the leaders of Islam refused because they regarded Jerusalem their second most holy place, next to Mecca. The Islam that is practiced today, is a fake religion and the Quran is not authentic. Scholars have you thinking that these books are divine or new revelations, and they are nothing more than condensed books taken from the ancient writings. And humans have taken it upon themselves to change, rearrange words and take out certain things. Take for instance, in the very Quran of the Muslims, three chapters were removed, Surah Kal, Maternal Uncle, Surah Hoft, Pace, Surah Narain, Illumination. They are not honest enough to tell you the truth. This is done deliberately in order to keep you under the spell of sleep or ignorance. Religion is used to keep you under control, your mind and thought patterns. And it is sad that human life is lost on some fictitious books called the Quran and the Bible that men made up. In Islam compulsion is when someone is forced to convert to the religion or die. According to the American Heritage Dictionary the word compulsion means, compulsion, 1a, the act of compelling, b, the state of being compelled, 2a, an irresistible impulse to act, regardless of the rationality of the motivation, b, an act or acts performed in response to such an impulse. Middle English, from Old French, from Late Latin compulsed, compulsion, from Latin compulsus, past participle of compeller, to compel, compulsion is from the word compel which is defined as, compel, compelled, compelling, compels. 1, to force, drive, or constrain, 2, to necessitate or pressure by force, exact, 3, to exert a strong, irresistible force on, sway, Middle English compellin, from Latin compeller, com plus puller, to drive, so the word compulsion means to exert force, pressure, to act on impulse which is usually done without thinking. The Quran 2-256 to says, there is no compulsion in Islam, and I quote, let there be no compulsion in religion, truth stands out clear from error, whoever rejects evil and believes in God hath grasped the most trustworthy handhold, that never breaks, 
and God heareth and knoweth all things. However, Muslims will readily kill and have been killing since Islam began to spread this so-called non-compulsory religion. If people didn't accept Islam, they were killed, eyes poked out, burnt and beheaded by Muhammad and all of the caliphs. They really thought they were doing Islam a favor by making people convert by force however the person did out of fear not faith which means that they would never be a good Muslim or one who really fears Allah. They would fear the person who converted them more than their God Allah. Muslims are still going by the poorest examples. Millions of people were killed in Iraq, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, Sudan, Arabia, Yemen, Persia etc. because of Islam trying to increase its adherence under compulsion. Why couldn't Allah use his powers to let the Muslims convert people peacefully to his glorious religion? That way the person's heart would be in the right place. This is why I say Muslims are worshipping a powerless God. This religion started 1400 years ago and you still have bloodthirsty Muhammadans running around trying to convert by way of the sword. Then you have prominent sheikhs in the Islamic world who have a major influence over the weak minds of the people. These so-called learnt men can say anything and people believe in their words without investigating or using their own brains to think something out logically. One such person is Sheikh Muhammad Mutawili al-Sharawi. He is one of the most famous so-called scholars in Egypt. He has television programs that millions of people watch all over the Islamic world and follows his opinion. On his show he attacks Christianity calling them infidels and stirring Muslims in Egypt into a frenzy to attack Christian churches, bum them and kill the infidels. In one of his books You Ask and Islam Answers, page 52, part 2 he states, Some ask, how does Islam say that there is no compulsion in faith, and yet it commands the killing of the apostate? We say to them, you are free to believe or not to believe, but once you embrace the faith you are not free, anymore, and you should be bound to Islam otherwise you will suffer punishment and the restrictions, among them is the killing of the apostate, that is, there is not compulsion in embracing the faith but, if you do, you are not free to relinquish it. Why? Why force someone to do something against their will? Think, if Allah really wanted to worship him or follow his religion, wouldn't he open the person's heart and make them accept Islam without having to put a gun to their heads? This killing of the apostate has become law in Islam and it is sad. Almost every major Islamic history book documents these facts. Even after the conquest of Mecca, the pilgrimage has become one of the pillars of Islam. Muhammad banned the so-called paganistic tribes from the Hajj after the year of the conquest. They were given four months either to embrace Islam or be killed, which is compulsion, which means to be forced, to compel, to drive, constrain. Something Allah says not to do, force the religion, according to Quran 2 to 256, let there be no compulsion in religion, truth stands out clear from error, whoever rejects evil and believes in God hath grasped the most trustworthy handhold, that never breaks, and God heareth and knoweth all things. Obviously, Muhammad and his companions went against this law. He was wrong. Muhammad himself apparently didn't have faith or thought Islam which was supposed to be the truth, could stand up against clear error, which was the Arab so-called paganism. After that, Muhammad made very slight changes in the ceremonial rituals of the pilgrimage although he destroyed all the 360 idols of the Kaaba. Yet, Muhammad himself continued to practice many paganistic rituals. He did not abolish them nor reject them. That created some panic among his followers who expected him to uproot these idolatrous, paganistic ways. Remember Muhammad's father Abdullah was an idol worshipper and their family was rooted in it before Islam came along. And based on your hadith, Muhammad believed in moon worship. Hadith 5073, when the Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him, saw the new moon, he said, a new moon of good and right guidance, a new moon of good and right guidance. I believe in him who created you three times. He would then says, praise be to Allah who has made such and such a month to pass and has brought such and such a month. And in Hadith 1544 says, Yahya related to me from Malik from Zaid ibn Aslam from Atta ibn Yashar from Abdullah as son of Ihi that the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, the sun rises and with it is a horn of shaitan and when the sun gets higher the horn leaves it. Then when the sun reaches the meridian the horn joins it and when the sun declines the horn leaves it, and when the sun has nearly set it joins again. The Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, forbade prayer at these times. The Prophet Muhammad is wrong, according to your hadith. The sun does not move the planet moves nor does the sun set. Furthermore, it goes to show once again that the Muslims world is out of touch and obsolete.